Hey, this is David Kennedy, and in today's video, I'll be showing you my favorite Muse score tips and tricks for a more efficient workflow. To save you some time, I've timestamped everything below in the description box. So if you know most of the tips already, you can see which ones are covered, and then you can easily hop to the ones where you might gain value. This video is acting as a follow-up video I've already done about MuseScore, and I've linked that above now. So if you're on the hunt for more tips and shortcuts after this video, go check that one out. Thank you so much as ever for watching, and please hit subscribe if you found any value in this video. So without further delay, we're gonna hop into MuseScore now. And the first tip is to do with creating a shortcut for a show and hide option. So here we are inside of MuseScore. This is a melody exercise that I will give to students to complete. The first four bars are given to them and they'll have to write the rest of the 16 bar melody. Before I get to the tip, I just wanna show you what I would do to set this up more fully. So I will select or click this bar and then while holding down shift, I'm gonna click the very last bar of the melody, which is bar 16, and that will highlight the whole lot for me. And now I'm gonna click V on my keyboard and that will get rid of all of the rests, which allows the students then to write in their own melody over the top. While holding down shift and pressing the right bracket button on my keyboard, I can elongate these four bars. So this now looks like the finished product of what the student will receive. But the tip here is I've got a shortcut for showing and hiding the unprintable, the invisible, and the frames. Traditionally, how you would have to show and hide those is you'd come up to the view panel, you would go down to show invisible and then click it. And as soon as you hit show invisible, the view panel menu would disappear, which is very frustrating because then every time you want to get into show and printable, it disappears again and you'd have to click it again and go into show frames. To save me time when I want to just see what the student will see it ultimately, I just created a shortcut. I've covered how to create a shortcut in my last video, but I'll quickly go through it here. So if you press command on a Mac or control on a Windows PC, and then press comma, that will bring up this uh, preferences panel. So we have MuseCore preferences. If I go into the shortcuts tab, this will bring up all of the areas that can have a shortcut. So what I did was I scrolled down to the show frames. I would have double clicked show frames and then I input the, where it says new shortcut, I inserted control on a Mac and F and that's what I remember now as being the shortcut for that. I did the same then with show invisible and I did the same with show unprintable. So each of them is control U, control I, control I and control F. For tip two, I've bundled together three tips that are fairly similar to one another. The first of which is moving a note up or down diatonically. So in a default situation, the up and down arrows will move a note of a piece, the first note in this instance, up or down chromatically. So B to C to C sharp to D and so on. And down similarly will flatten or raise it by semitone. But if you want to move that diatonically, you hold down Option on a Mac and Shift, or Alt and Shift on a Windows PC, and then it will move through the scale of whatever key you're in. The second one is about the stem direction and the quick, the quick way of, of changing the direction of a stem. So at the minute, the stem is obviously going down on the first note. If I hit X on the keyboard, it'll change the stem direction. This is very useful when you have a reduced score for SATB choirs and you need the uh, soprano and altos to fit on the same stave. It can be a good way of identifying which is alto and which is soprano. And the last one is to do with hopping between two different staves. So this is a grand stave or a piano stave. And if I wanna edit notes up on the treble clef, I can be up here. But if I hold down option and press the down key, that will hop, hop down to the bass part. And it's just a, a quick way of hopping between each stave. And just a shameful plug here, this is a document that I've worked on for a while 
uh, doing all of the solutions to question five on the composing paper in Ireland from the years 1999 all the way through to 2021. So I have that up on my Patreon, the solutions of all of those questions. I have that up on my Patreon. On the same tier on my Patreon, I also have the blank boxes. So each of the questions with blank boxes. Um, so you can access that on the Patreon link. I'll leave all of the links in the description box below. So tip three is all about isolating parts from a larger score. What I have here is an orchestral score of Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet in mu score format. And what's really useful for me as a teacher who teaches this uh, work on the Liebmungsair course is being able to isolate out single parts wherever the theme occurs and similarly with any accompaniments that happen to be able to show students um, different aspects of the score. So how you go about creating parts and you'll see here I've done it entirely for this whole piece. So I have every single part in its own uh, bracket and it kind of looks like this. So this is the piccolo. And again, I have, I have most of these in continuous view um, as I'm making a video, an analysis video on this. And it was actually very helpful to shoot the playing of this in continuous view so that for the video, I can have not a lot of clutter on the screen. But I have this for each of the instruments you'll see there as I go along. So how I make the parts is you come up to file, you go down to where it says parts, and you'll also see I've created a shortcut for that for myself and it's shift and P for parts. But if you select on parts and let's say we wanted to create a, a new part underneath the last one, I'll just hit a single part and then this thing part appears. And then you can uh, do a lot of things from here. So you can retitle that to say, let's say you wanted a com combination of all of the woodwind together. So if I call this woodwind, then I can add Piccolo, flutes, piccolo, flutes, oboes, English horn, clarinets, and bassoons. And if I wanted that to be the new part, I hit OK and it will combine all of these sections. Obviously, I can do a single part. So if I just wanted piccolo, I can retitle that piccolo. I've already done that up above and it'll just give me out the piccolo part, but you can also do combinations, which I thought was a very useful tip. Once you press OK on that, it will create the part. So then at the very end here in my parts, there should be a combination of woodwind. And you'll see here, that's all of the woodwind. Another shameful plug here for my Patreon page, but I actually have this uploaded to my Patreon and I'll leave that link below in the description box. So this file with all of the separated parts is already done for you on my Patreon. Tip four is very straightforward. It's about putting in an anacrusis or an upbeat. So you see here we're in six eight, but we have the pickup bar of a quaver into the main bar one. And how you do this on MuseScore is you right click the bar, go to measure properties, and then measure duration the nominal, as in the time signature we're in, is 6-8. And the actual one, you want to change it to whatever length of upbeat you need. And in this case, we need one quaver, so it's going to be one eight note. You'll also want to tick this box, exclude from measure count, because then the bar of this piece, it starts from the count of one here and all the way down. And then the last bar of the piece, similarly here, you want to have this measure equal five eighths because the last bar in combination with the upbeat bar should be a full bar six. Tip five is about turning on and off bar numbers. This actually took me longer to figure out than I would have liked. But if you go up to format, go to style, and then normally the first thing selected is score. But if you go down to measure numbers and you just click this little box, that turns on and off and you'll see them at the side there, turns on and off the bar numbers. Within this little panel as well, you can do a lot of things. So if you wanted them at intervals of every bar, you could do that or every system. 
and then you can select whether the first bar is shown or not. And again, if you look over to the left, you can see that on and off. Tip six is about changing the instrument sound throughout a piece of music. So in this example here, the default here is set to a piano sound. So if I want to change that sound on the second bar, what I do is select the bar. I'm going to hit the function key and F9 to bring up my palettes. And then with the text drop down, I'm going to select change instrument. At this point, I can choose to change to whatever instrument I want. And I'm going to change the flute just for example now. A little text will appear called to flute and if I play this back now you'll hear that it goes from piano sound to a flute sound. The add-on tip here is if I select that bar again with the flute and right click and I go to staff or part properties when you open this up it will give you the pitch range of the instrument that you've changed to. So the amateur range, unusable pitch range, is from a C4 to an A6, and then they cite the professional range of a flute from a B3 to a D7. This can be very useful for teaching students how to orchestrate for different instruments. And also a quick reminder for ourselves if we're arranging or composing for an ensemble. Just to be aware that if you change the instrument to a transposing instrument, like a, clarin like a trumpet in B flat, then it will, unless you have concert pitch selected, it will put in the transposing bar. Tip seven is a quick way of using slurs as you write a music score. So to begin with, I'm gonna select bar five here. I'm gonna click N on my keyboard and that puts it into insert mode or note input mode. And now I'm gonna click four to access my quaver rhythms and now to slur, the quickest way is press the note you want. We'll start on D, press S to create the slur. And now the notes that you put in will all be slurred. Until you hit S again, and then the notes will not be slurred. And if we were to start again, press S. And you'll see there the slur stays until you hit S again. Tip 8 is about resizing the distances between each system. So again, I'm going to bring up the palettes by hitting function and F9. And then if I come all the way down to breaks and spacers, if you grab this spacer and bring it onto bar 1, then you have the ability to drag them closer or further, depending on what you want. Sometimes I find the gap actually too wide and in that case I actually like to bring them together a bit closer. In this last section of the video I want to show you three ways that I make use of musescore.com. These are very practical examples of how I teach music to various ensembles that I conduct. What you can see here on screen is a score that I transcribed from a performance by the Sunday Service Choir. And this was very helpful for the choir members to be able to practice along with a backing track without having to download MuseCore themselves and by just visiting the website. And it's very easy to share a link. This plays back wherever you click. And it will show each person where to be. Another example of this is a guitar piece that I composed myself and then the tabs were available to read, as was the sheet music. And again, students, the guitar students that I had in that ensemble could practice along. This makes rehearsals far more efficient and more productive. The second way that I make use of MuseScore.com is by searching up sheet music. At one time on MuseScore.com, it was actually very hard to find trustworthy music or music that was credibly transcribed. But lately I've found that the quality of transcriptions is really, really good from the user base. The other thing that they have is these official score sites where you can't download them to a music score file but if you just wanted to play along or use it as an example in your teaching you can get a very accurate score as good as musicnotes.com or any of the other purchasing scores.
And the final idea I have about using MuseScore.com as a teaching resource is that if you had a one-to-one -one instrumental lesson, i.e. piano or guitar, you could upload practice tabs of scales and other technical aspects of the instrument uh, as a MuseScore file to the site. And again, it becomes a practice resource for whatever student you had. You can hear the music being played along at the same time, and you can also see the visual of either the tabs or the sheet music. Also, if piano is the instrument, you can choose these functions here where it actually shows you where to put your fingers on the keyboard. So if I play just this bit. And I know that some of my students use MuseScore.com in this way to learn piano parts. So that's it for this video. If you stayed to now, thank you so much for watching. Have a look in the description box below for any of the resources mentioned throughout this video. If this video has helped you in any kind of way, please consider hitting the subscribe button. It really means the world to me. This has been David Kennedy and I'll see you in the next one.